Okay, I want to do a couple of house cleaning items. First of all, you know, it was great to see Philip up here. Where's Philip? It was good to see you singing, man. That's awesome. What a friend we have in Jesus. Great version. And one of the verses, he says, is there trouble anywhere? And I just looked at him. Uh, of course there's trouble right there. <laughs> no. Uh, the second thing is yesterday I preached this message to our Saturday service. And just so you know, when my pastor was there, he was taking notes. It's awesome when your boss sits in front of you. Just, he was like right in the middle. So at the end of the service, this is what he told me. He said, Jose, your message is too short. I timed it. It's like 18 minutes long. You got to add. I said, okay, so 60 minutes from now, go to him. <laughs> Don't complain to me. It's all on him. I, I was bringing you an 18-minute servant, and he made it 55. So <laughs> third thing, one more, I'm done. I've been saying Abacuc for the last half an hour. So if I mispronounce the name Habakkuk, give me a break, all right? <laughs> I'm probably going to do that <laughs> a couple of times. If you, say, if you hear something like Abacuc, you know what I mean. <laughs> no, it's great to be with you here this morning. I did that to relax, right? We got to get it out. No, anyways, uh, it's so good to be here. Uh, we're going to be in Habakkuk. Is that how you say it? Habakkuk? Habakkuk. Chapter 3, and we're going to stay in one verse, verse 2. And today I want to talk about revival. Actually, about personal revival. And we're not going to define what that means, but that's what we're going to talk about. But I want to ask you a question as we start. How would you fill in the blank for this question? Okay, if I ask you, this world is a... <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that sounded like a choir. Mess. <laughs> what about if you were to answer it in your own life? My life is a... <laughs> That's a little bit more quiet. The room got quieter. Nobody... She said circus yesterday. <laughs> I remember that. She was like, my life is a circus. I thought that was good. Anyways, uh, this past week I had the opportunity... I don't know if I call it an opportunity now, but I, I had an opportunity to attend a human trafficking symposium at Nova Southeastern University, and, and it was put together by a group called CREATE. The letters stand for Coalition for Research and Education Against Trafficking and Exploitation. Our beautiful state of Florida ranks number three in the United States in human trafficking, number three, and especially in sex trafficking of women and girls. The statistics are horrible. There's 40.3 million slaves globally. Of those 200,000 are right here in the United States. 200,000 slaves. 22% are used for sex. 71% are women and girls. 33% of all sex slaves, of the whole 40 million, 33% are children. One person is trafficked in the United States every 10 minutes. That's horrible. The stories I heard on Tuesday were horrendous. I won't even repeat them here. And the prospects of this ending anytime soon are really discouraging. And I want to challenge all of us to do something about it. We need to do something about this issue. But for me, it was a very sad day. It was a, an eye-opening day. You know, it's one of those things that, whoa, really? Um, it was a day of some tears. It was a day of some pain. Um, I heard all these experts describing the condition of the human heart in our culture. And maybe they didn't know that that's what they were doing, but that is exactly what they were doing. They were describing the horrible condition of the human heart in this culture that we live in. Now this morning, I don't want to talk about that. I'm here to talk about our heart, about the condition of our heart. Those of us that call ourselves Christians, how is your heart this morning? How, how is your, your walk with the Lord is it firm? Is it wobbly? Is it even there? Do you have a relationship with God? 
There was a man called George Santayana that in 1905 said that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And I believe that this is what we, or not all of us, but most of us do. I think most of us try to forget our past or conveniently forget some of our past. And you know, we come to God probably out of desperation. I don't know about you, but I came to God out of desperation, out of being completely tired of the life that I was living, tired of the conditions, was completely broken. You know, many of us come to God at that point where we can't do anything more. And God, in his mercy, he reached out his hand and, and, and he saves us from our own, from ourselves, right? And man, life is good with God, right? We meet good people. We come to a church like this when we see all these beautiful, smiling faces. Life is good. We start studying our word, right? We learn the words. Oh, bless, brother. Be blessed. How you doing? Blessed, man. I'm blessed. Right? We learn all the lingo. We pray. We do the things that we got to do. But little by little, as the time goes by, we start thinking back. And the funny thing is when you think back, I don't know about you. I'm just talking about myself. I'm sure I'm talking about you too. We have selective memory. Right? We think of the good old times. I've never heard anybody say that the old times were not good. Yeah, when we were in the good old times, we were hoping that they would change. But for some reason, they're good old times. So we have this selective memory, and we start thinking about the good things of that past life, how much fun we were having, and we even get a niche to go back to it, right? And I know many of us actually do. This is what happened to the Israelites in the Bible in the Old Testament. Time and time again, you see them, they get into a bad situation, normally because they disobey God. So they, they cry out to God for deliverance. God comes and delivers them. They're happy. They're good with God for a few years. And after a little bit, they go back to doing what was right in their own eyes. Right? They get back in trouble. They cry back out to God. And it goes on and on. I remember a couple of weeks ago, I was listening to the book of Joshua with Xiaomi. And, and at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua stands before the people and says, You choose what God you're going to follow, okay? Because me and my house... We're following the God of Israel. And everybody's like, oh, man, we're with you. Wherever you go, we're going to go. You're going to follow? Sure, we'll follow. But it says there that as soon as he died, they went their own ways. Another cool story is the story of Gideon. Have you seen the story of Gideon? And Gideon lives, and everybody's following Gideon and his God. And as soon as he dies, the Bible says they did what was good in their own eyes. We saw with Moses in the desert, right? The Israelites are in the desert. They're complaining about food. And they're like, man, let's go back to Egypt. At least there we had a decent meal. But yeah, but you also have lashes in your back. You were being, getting beat up to death. You don't remember that part, huh? You only remember the fish. And I think many of us do that. We have this selective memory about our past, and we end up going right back to it. So we see here in the book of Habakkuk, if you've been studying with us in the last couple of weeks, we have seen that Israel had once more forgotten God, going in their own ways, rebelled against God, and they were in trouble again. And this time, even the prophet Habakkuk is looking at it and questioning God. How long, God? Hey, are you there? Hello, we need your deliverance again. Hello, where are you? It sounded like my granddaughter. She, Papa, where are you? Oh, man, I miss her. But that's what they did to God. It's like, where are you? And even Habakkuk had a, a condition in him. He was doubting his faith. He was doubting God's motives for his people. Then God answers him and makes him understand, listen, I know the Babylonians are bad people, and they deserve judgment. But you Israelites are bad people too, and you deserve judgment too, and I'm going to use them to judge you. And then I'll give them their judgment. And I think this crisis of belief brings Habakkuk to a great place where he becomes like a fertile soil where God can work in him and through him. And my friends, sometimes God allows circumstances, tough circumstances in our lives to uh, make us this fertile soil where he can actually work in and through. So we see here in verse 2 of chapter 3, this is the only verse we're going to read today, well, from Habakkuk, but uh, 
You can stay right there. It says, O oh Lord, I have heard your speech and was afraid. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. In wrath, O oh God, remember mercy. Let's pray. Lord God, Father, would you speak to us through your word this morning? Father, we are people just like the Israelites. We come, we go, we turn back, we come back. But today, Father, would you help us through the power of the Holy Spirit to make a decision to stay? Would you revive us today, O oh Lord? I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. So here we have Habakkuk. Having expressed his lament, having heard from God in the first two chapters, he now realizes that the problem is not what God is or isn't doing. The problem is his faith in the God he serves. It's not whether God is there or is not there, whether he was or he's not. It's his faith that is going back and forth. He's paid so much attention to what's going on in the world that he forgot to pay attention to the God that rules the world. You know, when I came out of there Tuesday, I could have come out doubting and saying, man, God, why do you allow all this stuff? Why would you allow a 14-year-old girl to get beat up like that? That doesn't make any sense. Where are you? But we can't take our eyes off of God. He told Habakkuk in chapter 2, verse 14, that the just will live by what? By faith. Not by sight. And here we have Habakkuk was living by sight. He wasn't living by faith. And all of a sudden he says, oh, Lord, wait a second. I'm realizing this. I remember what has been said about you. Oh, man, I'm thinking back to your word. And you can see in the following verses, we're not going to read them today. You'll get there next week. But you'll see that he started thinking about what God did in Egypt, how he got him out of Egypt, how he opened the Red Sea. All that He starts remembering how who God is, how powerful he is. How mighty he is. And he even remembers his wrath. And he says, oh God. He says, I fear. He says, oh Lord, do I fear. Remember how big, how majestic, how powerful God is brought him to the fear of the Lord. And it should bring each and every one of us to the fear of the Lord. And this is not a fearful of God. He's not afraid of God. He's in awe of God. But my friends, I want to tell you this morning, if you want to experience personal revival, you need to live in awe of God. You need to live in awe of God. Now I want to define a couple of words here, okay, so we understand what we're talking about. First of all, what do I mean by revival? We have all heard this word, right? We probably use it all the time. And Pastor and I, I'm sure he does it as well as I do. We hear it all the time. Pastor, we need a revival in this church. And that's okay. I mean, I think most people, what they mean is, Pastor, we want to see this church full. You know, if you went, ben, came here to the, to the Big Daddy Weave concert, you know, the, the place was packed, 1,400 people. And most people that came by from the church, I would like to see the church like this on Sunday. They want to see revival. We want to see the church packed, right? We want to see a lot of people accepting Christ. Okay, but I think revival is not seeing a building full of a lot of people accepting Christ. I think those are the results of revival, not the revival itself. The revival is a personal thing. Revival starts in each and every one of us. It comes from, from a Latin word, revive. It very simply means what? To live again. Revive, to live again, right? <laughs> to make it alive again. It's when something or someone is, is dead or, or apparently dead and is brought back to life. Revive. Revival in the Christian sense has been defined. I got two definitions for you. One by Stephen Olford. It says revival is an invasion from heaven. This is a beautiful definition. An invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. I like that. An invasion from heaven that brings a conscious awareness of God. Another definition by Vance Havner is, revival is the church falling in love with Jesus all over again. I love that. 
I went on vacation in September, and I fell in love with my wife all over again. It's like year one. <laughs> Anyways, I don't know why I come up with this stuff, but <laughs> that was not in my notes. Anyways, for, <laughs> for uh, now, now I can't continue, you see? For our message today, I would like it to define this way, and this is my definition, so please don't knock it down, okay? But this is how I want to define revival today for us. A recognition of God's rightful position in my life. A recognition of God's rightful position in my life. Therefore, it is there, it is right there in the fear of the Lord the revival begins. Right there in the fear of the Lord. Why do I say that? Because we all know that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Wisdom. Right? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So now, what do we mean by the fear of the Lord? Okay? This is not being afraid of God like he is a, uh, a monster or a spooky monster or a big bat wolf or something like that. Okay? This is not being afraid. The fear of the Lord refers to reverence. It refers to, to a refer reverential trust in God. And this is key for us. As children of God, this is the key. This is the key for a consistent walk with God. It is understanding who God is and who I'm not. It's understanding his position and mine. Okay? How do you see God in your life? Are you in awe of God? Do you see him for who he is and for what he is? He is the king. Do you see him as your king? Jesus came preaching, right? The kingdom of God. He taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. The Bible says in Revelation that when Jesus returned, he will be named what? The king of kings and lord of lords. He is the king. Is that how you see him? The interesting part is this. We make Christ our king to the degree that we obey him. We make Christ our king only to the degree that we obey him. Dr. Jim Dennison wrote this week, it was pretty interesting that he happened to write this this week. He said, if he is only our savior, we can accept his salvation but fail to offer him complete obedience. If God is only our father, his children can disregard his will. And if he's only our counselor, we can reject his advice. And yes, God is our savior. He is our father. He is our counselor. But he is also our king. And to know whether Jesus is truly the king in your life, you only have to ask yourself one question. Are there any areas in my life where I'm disobeying God? That's the question. What areas are there in my life where I'm disobeying God? Which areas of my life do I have hidden from God? I'm still holding back from Him. Do you lie? Do you cheat? Are you living with a secret sin? What areas? And listen, I got pounded with this this week. Hey, you guys here one time for 20 minutes on a Sunday, but we here for five days, God pounding you with the same thing. What areas of your life, Jose? So this is not just for you. But my brothers and sisters, in order to experience revival in your life, in order to live in the freedom, in the freedom that Christ wants for us, we must see him as who he is, and we must obey him. The psalmist says something interesting in Psalm 119, 38. This is David writing. He said, establish your word to your servant who is devoted to fearing you. I love that. He is devoted to fearing you. And David understood that the wisdom necessary to live a life pleasing to God came from being established in his word 
with a correct understanding of his position before God. He understood that. See, he knew that the word and the law are not there to restrict us. They're there to help us to live free in Christ. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. He continued on verse 39, and he says, Turn away my reproach, which I, which I dread, for your judgments are good. And then in verse 40, he says, Behold, I long for your precepts. Oh, my goodness, that sounds so good. I long for your precepts. Revive me in your righteousness. You see, you see where the revival is coming from? Is God uses his word to transform us and make us alive again in him, to revive us in him. My friends, righteous behavior, love for God's word, and revival in my life and yours is found only in our correct understanding of who God is and obeying him unconditionally. 1 Peter Sorry, in 2 Peter, the Apostle Peter said, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. See, it is through the knowledge of Jesus Christ, through accepting him as your Savior, that God, through the Holy Spirit, gives you all you need to obey, to live a godly life. So I put there in your, in your outlines, to experience personal revival, I must live in obedience to God. I must live in awe of God, but I must live in obedience to God. And again, I say, you can only make Christ the king in your life as, uh, to the degree that you obey him. Jesus said in John 14, 15, he said, if you love me, keep, obey my commands. If you love me, obey my commands keep my commands. And, and I think with all love I can give you that the reason we continue to struggle in our Christian walk is because we're trying to do it on our own. We don't see God as big enough. We see us as big and powerful, and I want to live on my own. And listen, I'm not trying to judge. I know life is tough, okay? Unfortunately, I've been there and done that. It's tough. But what I'm saying this morning is life is tougher when you live it on your own instead of obeying God. And I want to make this clear. I want you to understand, I'm not saying we get saved by obedience to God's word. That's not what I'm saying here. I'm saying if we're saved, we will obey God's word. Okay? We see the example right here in the Israelites. You know, every time they try to do something in their, that is good in their own eyes, they walk away from the will of God. You know, the point with this obedience thing is even stronger for those of us that call ourselves Christians. <laughs> it is really an indication of our salvation. Look with me at 1 John 2. 1 John 2, 3 says, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, I'm a Christian, but does not keep his commandment is what? A liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his words, in him truly the love of God is perfected. And by this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him, look at obedience again, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. It's right there. I can say I'm a Christian all I want, but if I'm not obeying God, I'm only lying to myself. I'm not lying to God. He already knows I'm not, but I'm only lying to myself. You see, again, I'm not saying that you become a Christian by obeying the Word of God, but obedience is an outside indicator of my internal condition. Obedience shows what's in my heart. If you want revival in your life, if you want to walk in the freedom of God, listen, give him his rightful position in your life. Make him your king. Go to his word. 
remember the things he has done and obey it and obey it. And that brings us to the third point in that outline. That to experience personal revival, I must live with hope in Christ. I must live with hope in God. This is the last part of the verse. Habakkuk asked God to show himself merciful. Look at it with me in verse 2, the, the second part. It says, in the midst of the years, revive it. In the midst of the years, make it known. And in wrath, remember mercy. He's remembering what God has done. He's remembering the power of God. He goes, please have some compassion. Have some mercy. In the midst of the year, we can translate it as, as the years approach. As the years, as the time is coming near. Okay? It was Adam Clark that says, the nearer the time, the clearer and fuller is the prediction. And the signs of the time show that the complete fulfillment is at hand. It's right there. See, the judgment of Israel was coming. Habakkuk could see it coming. He knew it was unavoidable. So he sees it coming. He sees the Babylonians becoming powerful around the world. This thing is happening. God said it was going to happen. It's coming. And he goes to God and he says, please, God, have mercy. Have mercy upon them that come to you in prayer and humiliation. Have mercy on those that turn their back to you. You know, as we look at our world, as you listen to things like I did on Tuesday, as we see the, the good being called bad and the bad being called good, as we see all the people out there doing what's right in their own eyes, we can see it coming, can't we? We can see the prophecies of God nearing our time. And we know his judgment will be tough. It will be fair, but it will be tough. And we know our Savior is coming back. He promised. But he said when I, he comes back, he's coming to judge. He's coming to judge and this could lead some of us to be afraid and if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior my friend you should be afraid because the wrath of God is coming you see all of our sins will be judged either they will be judged in the throne of God or they have been judged in the cross of Christ but all of them will be judged If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, man, today is a good day to repent from your ways, to open your heart to him and accept him. If you feel that need inside of you, this is not coming from you. This is the Holy Spirit doing a work in you. Don't resist it. Obey. For those of us that know Christ, How are you living your life? Have you given him the right position in your life? You know, judgment is coming, and the Bible says that those names that are not in the book of life will be thrown into what is called the second death, the lake of fire, eternal separation from God. But those of us that know him, we can live in hope because the judgment, the wrath of God was poured down on Jesus on the cross. And we have hope of eternal life with God. That is our hope. And this morning, I want to give you a chance for both of us, those that don't know Christ, to come to know him as your Lord and Savior so that you don't have to be afraid of God, but you can live in the fear of God, in awe of God. And for those of us that are Christians, that perhaps we've been living life our own way we've been doing what is good in our own eyes we've been doing what we like we've been remembering our past and saying man that was pretty good i want to go back i want to give us an opportunity to come and repent first john 1 9 says if you confess your sins he's faithful and just and he will forgive you he will cleanse you you can't do enough 
to have God walk away from you. And you can't do anything to make him love you more. He loves you so much he gave his son. That's what he's done for each and every one of us. And today as we end this message, I want to give you that opportunity. I've asked Jonas to sing a song that I absolutely love. It's based on Psalm 130. I hope he's singing it. I don't know. I didn't confirm it. But the song says, I will wait for you. It says, in your word, I will delight. It says, I will wait for you, for you satisfy me. He says, I will wait until my soul is satisfied. I want you to live here transformed this morning. I want you to live here this morning satisfied with who God is in your life and who you are. You're not garbage. You're not an accident. And you don't have to be anybody's slave. You have only one king, and that is Jesus Christ. And what he wants to do is to give you freedom. He wants to give you freedom. So I'm going to ask you to stand with me. The altars are open like always. I know it doesn't make a difference whether you pray in your seat or on the altar, but sometimes symbolically we need to go before the Lord and just put things before the Lord. And if you want to come, feel free to come and lay at his feet and say, Jesus, I, I repent of my sin. I understand I've been living life my own way and I want to change that. And I feel the power of the Holy Spirit leading me to accept you as my Lord and Savior. Oh man, he'll accept you. He wants to have a beautiful relationship with you. He wants to give you freedom. Lord Father, I pray that you touch every heart, every soul in this room, including my own. Father, if there's something we need to repent of, Father, that today, that this moment will be the moment. That we will repent, that we will confess it to you, and that we will be cleansed by you. So that we can have a personal revival with Jesus Christ by understanding your position in mine. We love you, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen.